Nearly six months of war have gone, and with them have gone casualties in the millions. Huge offensives have not produced the breakthrough victories that were expected, and optimism has given way to reality in every warring nation. And that reality is that current concepts and tactics of war do not work, and each leader must come up with completely new ideas if victory is ever to be had. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. When we left off, the Russians were bulling their way through the Carpathians toward the Hungarian plain. The Champagne Offensive was still in full force on the Western Front, and the Ottoman Third Army was in retreat from the Caucasus after having been crushed by the Russians. As we've seen, this war was, for the first time ever, a war that was not confined to the land and sea. The new year was bringing with it many new developments in the war in the skies. Although the German strategic bombing campaign against Britain that begins this month involved airships, as far back as the 2nd of January, four German airplanes had bombed Dunkirk, killing and wounding nearly 50 people. So you can see that we were slowly entering the age of the flying ace. But high commands placed more faith in the giant airships. Proposals were actually made to bomb England from Zeppelins as far back as August 1914. But it wasn't until January 7, 1915, that the Kaiser gave the green light. Though first, he forbade bombing London because he didn't want any of his relatives hurt. Here's what German Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz had to say about the program. Quote, the measure of the success will lie not only in the injury which will be caused to the enemy, but also in the significant effect it will have in diminishing the enemy's determination to prosecute the war." End quote. And indeed, the German raids on the British over the next few years would be more psychological than anything. They certainly brought death and destruction, but on a fairly small scale in the grand scheme of things. The point being that it had never happened before, and no Brit should feel safe at home. And think of how it was for the French and Belgians at home. We've spoken a lot the past few weeks of the small battles of the huge and seemingly endless continuing offensives on the Western Front, and the almost monotonous back and forth for little or no gain. And today, I thought I'd look at one action in a little more depth so you can see how they actually played out. This week saw the Battle of Soissons come to its end. Now, it had run from early in the month to the 14th. Before the battle, opposing trenches were near each other on a wooded height overlooking Cluy. The French were also dug in in quarries at the western spurs of the Vrigny Plateau. French artillery was posted at the edge of the plateau. Some German machine guns were buried by French artillery fire on the 7th. The French then charged and occupied the German trenches, where hand-to-hand -hand fighting would continue until the 11th, when the Germans, instead of attacking the heights, stormed the French observation posts. The French fire stopped, and the French trenches were captured. So the French then took new positions halfway down the heights, expecting more attacks from the German right and bringing up reinforcements. But the Germans, in a surprise move, attacked the French at Vrigny on the 13th, taking the trenches in minutes and then taking the whole plateau in a few hours. So now the French troops facing the German right were in a desperate position, and they surrendered on the 14th, and the whole French attack along a 15-kilometer front, was driven back several kilometers from the Ain River. The Germans captured 5,000 French prisoners during this battle, at which the Kaiser himself was present, and he presented German General Ivard von Lachu with the Order of Merit for his victory. But why did the French attack from a disadvantage in the first place? Well, if you look at the situation on the Western Front in January 1915, you get a better understanding of the attitude of French General Joseph Joffre. See, much of French industrial production was now controlled by the Germans, so Joffre did not favor the construction of an impermeable line of defenses. He needed to be on the offensive as a moral imperative to free his country's soil, and he saw his positions as a base for decisive offensive adventures across no man's land. Joffre thought of the Western Front in active and passive sectors, where the passive ones gave troops to the active ones for offensives. Now, these were basically determined by geography. Places that were wet and hilly, like Flanders in the north and the Vosch in the south, he figured should be passive, and the active sections should be the huge German salient in the middle, like at the Somme and in Champagne. The Champagne Offensive was now nearly a month old and had produced nothing except bodies. So by this time, Joffre was rethinking things, since the German defenses were just too strong. So he issued new instructions this month. 
In the first, he said that the active sections at the front were to be made up of strong points that could cover the ground both to the front and the sides with fire while the passive zones in between would only have lookouts. Now, they'd be heavily covered with barbed wire, but they would be held by fire from the active zones. And all the way across the entire front, there would be two belts of barbed wire, around 25 meters apart. The second instruction was that a second line was to be dug two miles behind the front line. The front should be held as thinly as possible to save on manpower, which could be used for offensives. Now, for this reason as well, outposts should not be too close to the enemy because he thought it wasted lives. This was completely the opposite of the British trench plans, which were to try to dominate no man's land by digging trenches closer to the enemy and launching trench raids and keeping an eye on the enemy from up close. In either case, the trenches did their job, and though thousands upon thousands of men were dying each week on the Western Front, many more would have died without digging in. On another front, though, we come to the end of an operation that claimed lives on an enormous scale, as this week, the Ottoman retreat from Sarakamish is complete. The Ottoman Third Army had been almost completely destroyed, partly by the Russian enemy, partly freezing to death in summer uniforms in the winter temperatures below minus 30 on the way to and from battle. Ottoman Minister of War Enver Pasha's campaign was a disaster on an almost unimaginable scale, with some estimates claiming that only 10% of the army made it back to their starting positions of three weeks ago. Pasha never commanded in the field again. Upon his return to Istanbul, he blamed the Armenians for his failures, specifically three units of Armenian volunteers in the Russian army that included men who had deserted from the Ottoman side. There was a great deal of tension already between the Turks and the Armenians, especially after the mid-1890s, when Armenian revolutionary activity had resulted in massacres of Armenians. But after Sarakamish, there had been some small-scale massacres of Turks by the Russian Armenian soldiers. And this, Pasha's laying of blame for the defeat, and the fact that there were around 150,000 Armenians living in Russia serving in the Tsar's army, were part of the groundwork for the Armenian genocide that was soon to begin. Here's an important side note. The Russians had claimed to their allies, the British and the French, that they were losing in the Caucasus and they needed a diversion. So on January 13th, 1915, the British government approved Winston Churchill's plan to try and break through the Dardanelles. Now that invasion is for the future, but one invasion did happen this week when South African troops conquer Svakopmund January 14th. And though we've seen several battles and skirmishes in Africa so far in the war, this one is a little different. This was South African troops, not British, not Indian, invading German Southwest Africa, what is now Namibia. Since the Boer War ended in defeat at the hands of the British in 1902, there were many South Africans, particular Prime Minister Louis Botha, who wished to show their loyalty to the crown. Hence, the invasion, which would also enlarge South Africa's sphere of influence. But this wasn't without controversy. There was a big chunk of the Afrikaner population who were still very resentful of the British and their conduct during the Boer War, which included concentration camps introduced by Lord Herbert Kitchener, who was now British Secretary of State for War. Also, Germany had been pro-Boer in that war, and many people had a problem going to war with their former ally, and several major military leaders even resigned over it. But the invasion happened, and this was the beginning of the attempted conquest of German Southwest Africa by the 50,000 troops of the South African Defense Force. And so at the end of the week, South Africans were in German territory. The French had been pushed back from the Ine, where they'd held since September, and the Ottomans were finding a scapegoat. We haven't spoken of the Eastern Front this week, partly because of time constraints, but partly because there was a rethinking going on there just now. Austro-Hungarian Army Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf, desperately seeking a new way to win, was about to launch a winter offensive high in the mountains against the Russians. Indeed, everyone was making new plans. Joffre was revising his concept of trench warfare. Churchill was planning an end around in the Mediterranean. Pasha was soon to come up with a new idea for Turkish conquest, and the Kaiser was taking to the skies. All these ideas were designed to finally gain an advantage, but all of these ideas would have the same end result. Millions of men would die.
A few months ago, the generals had to rethink their old classic strategies for the first time in the war. So check out our episode from August 21st, 1914, right here to see how new challenges for old generals led to carnage on the Western Front. And if you want to get into some deep discussion on our episodes, check out our own subreddit. And don't forget to click subscribe. See you next week.